Are, are you on that page now, the ACEN page? Uh, the yes, I see a picture of Gil right now. Oh, but I, I probably, it's probably because I've got to pause when I get to play. Yes, I see it. Okay. Yeah, I, I see your page. So it looks like we've got a good connection up. Um, yeah, and it's a minute too, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's uh, We are back on the ANCAP Entrepreneur Network. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a slow introduction since people will probably be joining us over the next 60 seconds or so. Uh, I wanted to come online a little bit early uh, just to make sure that I'd solved uh, my sound technology problems before. Uh, if anybody's in the chat room, can they let me know if they hear me okay? I'm, I'm speaking on Skype. I've got Steve Fairfax on the line. Uh, you hear my voice right now. Can you hear me okay? There's about a five-second uh, delay the last time I checked, Steve. Okay, somebody says that they can hear me. You want to just um, uh, do a quick sound check, Steve, and make sure everybody can hear you? Sure. Can everyone uh, hear me? This is Steve Fairfax speaking. I heard somebody okay. come over that okay. other day. I just got a there message. Uh, somebody says they can hear you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, uh, as I said, I've got Steve Fairfax on the line from M Technology. Uh, I first heard a presentation from Steve um, back at ASC 2010. Uh, he introduced some product ideas that were really exciting. Uh, it's different ways to conveniently introduce gold into the consumer market. Um, it, the presentation, he had some prototypes with him. Uh, I think rather than me talk about what I saw, Steve, why don't you just uh, give a sort of brief recap of your presentation uh, back at that stage? Sure. Well, I've been studying Austrian economics uh, since about 2003. Spent, spent about two hours a day in study. And uh, one of the a couple of fundamental tenets about Austrian economics is that uh, they teach that money is a market phenomenon. It's uh, it's not imposed by force, but uh, is uh, at least in principle can be arrived at by voluntary transactions. And uh, von Mises, in particular, describes a process wherein uh, one commodity, uh, which is originally wanted for its own sake, uh, is gradually. Uh, started to use as a commodity that's, that can be an intermediate between what uh, what you want and what someone else has. So this is a way to get the on barter. And uh, that isn't it just to have the one commodity at a time. It can happen to a number of things. So, for example, you might end up trading in the same uh, economy as it's progressing. You might trade butter and fish hooks and tobacco and uh, cotton and so forth. All of those things were traded in various economies at various times. But over time, there's a process of elimination where people come to select uh, ultimately just one commodity. And then there's an interesting thing where his theory breaks down uh, because he admits that the process in most societies uh, continues until you get to silver and gold. But then it stops. You end up with some societies that go silver and some that go gold, but you very rarely, end, uh, in fact, we haven't ended up with an economy uh, that goes uh, all the way to to gold or or silver. Uh, there's uh, there's both, and so I ask the question of myself: Well, why is that? You know, why why isn't why is the Mises theory breaking down here? He kind of shrugs it off in his uh, book by pointing out that uh, a, a successful theory of money has to accommodate multiple commodities, and he's quite right. But I go back to that initial assertion of his that the process should continue down to just one and ask why it doesn't. And the short answer is, I believe, that uh, it doesn't uh, continue because of the technical limitations of coins. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, the smallest gold coin that you can practically uh, carry around is somewhere in the neighborhood of an eighth of a troy ounce or a tenth of a troy ounce, something like that. And uh, even that coin is so small that people uh, routinely uh, compl 
complain about it. And so uh, it turns out that when you look through history, uh, in fact, uh, consumers, you know, the mass of consumers in the marketplace have never used gold routinely. Gold uh, and gold coins were used by the rich and used for major transactions, whereas commerce was done, uh, when it was done with money, would tend to be done with silver or copper coins. So, uh, yes, here's the slide that shows that uh, re- consumers have never routinely used gold. There was, uh, the Romans circulated a coin that was about a quarter troy ounce, uh, and that, that was around uh, for several hundred years, uh, about 500 years, actually, and then uh, that was uh, debased somewhat <laughs> to another coin that was only about one-seventh of a, a troy ounce. Uh, in the smallest U.S. gold coin today is a, a tenth of an ounce. There was actually a gold dollar that was introduced or used uh, in the U.S. when we were on the gold standard, but it was a twentieth of a troy ounce because the original gold standard here was uh, twenty about twenty dollars to the to the ounce, and that coin was widely criticized as being so small that it was just uh, you know easy to lose a pocket or something like that. And yet, a twentieth of an ounce of gold is you know is a lot of money. Uh, with gold uh, today's prices, you know, a 10 ounce coin is worth at least $150, and a 20 ounce coin is $75. That's that's a fair amount of money. It's not like you could buy a, your lunch or an ice cream cone or a pack of cigarettes with a gold coin. It's just not a practical unit. So consumers never routinely use gold. And uh, there's the next slide shows, you know, thank you, shows the... Uh, the range of things. So, you know, in the, sort of the middle left, you see a gold kilo. And these were the prices back when I gave the talk in March of 2010, yeah, uh, when gold was about well $1,100 an ounce, and now it's closer to 15 14 and change, I guess. So at that time, a gold kilo was worth, you know, $36,000, and uh, a one-ounce gold coin uh, was worth $1,100. And gold leaf, you know, which is this exquisitely thin, material that you have to use special paint brushes and other delicate things to handle uh, so you can use it to gild uh, picture frames and statues and stuff like that. Uh, just a four inch square piece of gold leaf has about 50 cents worth of gold in it, but of course it's completely impractical to handle. Now other people have attempted to address this, so there's these people who make a gold gram, and it's just that. It's a gram of gold and then they embed it in this credit card type thing, and that's the thing you see in the middle of the picture. Um, and that's about $36 worth of gold. But the U.S. gold coin that circulated the most were, uh, you know, sort of half ounce. Uh, that's the $10 gold coin at the top of the picture, you know, $650. Uh, the Swiss franc uh, was a, a coin that circulated uh, somewhat. That's $200 in today's. Um, and then on the very next page, I show what I believe is the smallest gold coin that's ever been made. You can advance uh, that slide one. Yeah, okay. It'll be about four seconds before it loops back. Okay, to the very good. It'll be ready so this is uh, what I call the Goldilocks problem, you know, either too big or, or too small. <laughs> so you see the gold gram in the upper right-hand corner, and then you see this is one troy grain of gold. Huh. There's a, a fellow in uh, New York, uh, Brooklyn, I think it is, who, uh, who makes these things, and I bought a few of them from him. And uh, while they're interesting heroes, you know, you, you literally can sneeze and lose these things. And there's a pencil point there to show you how small they are. And then that huge coin that you see below there, that's a silver coin. That's a one-ounce uh, uh, American uh, silver coin. And so, you know, that at the time, that was worth, oh, 10 or $15. These days, it's worth about $30. Uh, but when consumers use silver coins... Uh, they routinely complain that they're too heavy and clunky. Uh, so that's why you have this too big, too small. Gold's too valuable, and coins are, uh, silver is too heavy. So my point, uh, what I did the rest of the research on, and we might advance the slides here, is that uh, we don't, we are no longer bound by the technical limits of gold coins. We don't have to make such a teeny tiny gold coin. The other thing is that we, we have to admit, uh, you know, we, we, Austrian economics teaches that the successful entrepreneur is the one who uh, satisfies the desires of consumers. 
And so here's Ron Paul, and he he says, we've got to get the coinage. So he's, he's still stuck on the idea of a coin. But we've got to get coins into circulation and then build the political basis. Mm-hmm. But my point is that you, if you're going to give them coins, you, you, have to, you have to give them gold in amounts and in forms that consumers are used to. And everyone, consumers these days, large number of would want relatively small quantities of gold, something roughly comparable, you know, to the one, five, ten, twenty dollar bills that are used in uh, daily commerce. And they like paper money. Everyone's used to paper money. Everyone has wallets. Everyone has cash tills. So we need to go beyond the technical limits of gold, which is of coins, I should say, which has restricted the use of gold for thousands of years, and go to new uh, ways to do it. And so in the next slide, I believe, I talk a little bit about, uh, yes, about how you can do it. So gold leaf, ancient, ancient uh, uh, technique. Uh, you can pound gold by hand uh, in a process that takes many, many hours and requires quite a bit of skill, but it can be done down to four millionths of an inch thick. Uh, these days, integrated circuits, which, of course, are in all manner of uh, consumer products, use very fine gold wires to connect the internal integrated circuit to the pins of the package. And you can go on the internet and order this stuff, and you can get wires small as 600 micro inches in diameter, and that's a photomicrograph there on the right that shows how those things are bonded to the surface of uh, an integrated circuit uh, device. And then in the next uh, slide, there are other uh, uh, several other techniques. So gold ribbon is very easy. Uh, that picture there shows a, a hand uh, rolling mill that you can buy for a few hundred dollars. Uh, you can go on the internet again and find uh, people who will happily sell you at a premium, of course, over the gold price, but will sell you a uh, gold ribbon uh, down to about one one thousandth of an inch thick and in pretty much whatever width you want. Gold, uh, especially pure gold, is extremely malleable and it's relatively easy to, to roll it out. Then uh, packaging, everything from potato chips to electronic components like capacitors these days, relies upon uh, plastic films with a very thin but extremely uniform layer of metal on top. And the, a lot of times the, the metal is things like uh, silver or aluminum, but it can be gold. Uh, zinc is another one, uh, but it can be gold, and that can go to very thin layers. And then you can gold plate, and there's also gold inks, which actually have gold dissolved in them, and you can print the ink onto uh, any kind of substrate you want. So then I made a little table that just shows you the, how you could make uh, using these various technologies on the very next slide. Uh, use these technologies to uh, produce gold-bearing certificates, shall we say, in pretty much whatever amount you want. So if you wanted uh, a melt value of a penny, I could use uh, an inch and a quarter of one mil diameter wire and embed that. You know, that works out to, to be a ten thousandth of a uh, an inch, uh, I mean, a, a troy ounce, about a penny's worth of gold. If you wanted to do a dime or so, you could use gold leaf. Uh, the gold ribbon, uh, you see, has actually four places in this chart, and I can use it to make sort of a dollar, or five dollars, or ten dollars, or twenty dollars, uh, with ribbons that are quite reasonable in size, you know, about uh, point oh seven eight thick, and, uh, you know, one to five inches uh, long. So with that, I went ahead and made a few uh, prototypes just to demonstrate this, and uh, this was uh, very low-tech. Uh, it was, uh, I bought a uh, polyester film, which is already used in currency, uh, the currencies of Australia and New Zealand and uh, nine other countries are printed exclusively now on these polymer banknotes. They they last longer than uh, paper notes and so forth. So I bought these labels, sheet labels on the internet and ran them through a laser printer. And you can see on this picture, here's one one thousand of the ounce of gold and there is the gold. So I call this, uh, it's on the left-hand side of the picture, just to the right of the, the numbers, 0. .999. I call this a gold-bearing certificate. Mm-hmm. So it is not a promise of gold. It is gold. 
and uh, you know at today's prices that would be worth uh, approximately a dollar fifty or dollar forty melt value in gold. Now, in order to make this a commercially viable enterprise, I'd obviously have to charge some sort of premium. But the history of coinage uh, tells us that those premiums are going to be pretty small. You know, a few percent, uh, maybe five or or six percent at most. But so I have to learn how to produce these things inexpensively. Here's one hundredth of a troy ounce, which uh, these days would be you know fifteen or sixteen dollars worth of, uh, of gold melt value. Again, you can see this uh, is quite a modest piece of gold. That's just a piece of gold ribbon. It's about five thousandths of an inch thick. It's sandwiched between two pieces of the uh, polymer. This is the exact same plastic that's used in the banknotes. And this shows the front and rear side. So you see the, the on the top left, the 1 1,000th, on the right, 1 100th. And then I just made up some artwork on the front. Uh, the one is the surface of the moon. The other is the surface of the sun. Graphic design is not my long suit. Uh, this is just to show how simple uh, it is to produce these. So now the question is, well, so what? What do you do with them? Well, I'm a, I'm a small businessman. I run a small business now, and I'm keenly aware of what uh, I can do and, and what I can't do as a small business. And as I start discussing in the next slide, setting up a full currency system is a rather daunting task, and particularly for someone who doesn't particularly want to be uh, involved or molested by government, uh, trying to set up a currency system really isn't something I want us to do. But I think there's lots of people out there who might be interested in buying gold-bearing certificates because they're curious or because people start collecting them. After all, you know, we could, uh, the free state might want to issue some of them and Ron Paul might want to issue some of them and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of reasons people might want to buy these. Uh, trying to reform the money supply again, that's not what I'm taking on here. We, we all just saw what uh, what happened to Mr. Nothouse when he uh, tried that mm-hmm. with the uh, Liberty Dollar. Um, and while it may be true that consumers prefer sound money, none of the consumers alive today have ever had it. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's going to be very hard to sell it as money. Uh, I also, uh, like I say, uh, if I limit my challenges to the typical entrepreneur challenges of forming capital, producing it, and distributing these certificates, that's plenty for me, and I think there's a business there. Uh, by the way, I'm publicizing this so that some of the people listening to this or some of the people who read about it, I urge them to go out and start producing these things. Uh, it, it doesn't have to, This is not just my idea. I'm happy to give it away. Have, have you heard any uh, reports of people taking you up on that offer? Because I heard somebody talking about uh, uh, certificates with ribbon in them. Oh, I think they said they were circulating at uh, Porkfest in New Hampshire last year. Oh, well, very good. No, I didn't hear that. Uh, I've uh, sold a few and, and traded a few at conferences here and there. I saw them um, in demand at uh, the Scholars Conference. Uh, yes, were that, I sold one at the them. Scholars Conference, traded it for a uh, counterfeit gold coin, mm-hmm. and since I collect gold coins, I, I'm always interested in counterfeits, so I uh, I traded that, and I sold a few uh, at other uh, Mises Institute conferences to people who were interested. Uh, and so, the, I think in terms of... Uh, Going, you know, I want to make it clear. I'm not trying to compete with the Federal Reserve or the U.S. government or anything else for the money. I'm just trying to sell very small amounts of gold to people who are interested in owning very small amounts of gold. And the way you go forward then is, uh, you know, not by uh, taking over command of the money system and sort of in a central command and control, saying we're going to all switch to gold. You go forward because people who buy these things notice that they're value is either the same or perhaps goes up over time, whereas the value of the paper dollars they're holding goes down all the time. And someday, somewhere, someone offers these things in a bar or in a grocery store, (laughs) and they're accepted. And at that point, it's barter. But if the phenomena continues and you believe in the the wisdom and the the functions of the consumer marketplace, eventually, 
uh, you have the consumers voting quite literally with their wallets <laughs> to uh, to use uh, products like these as opposed to uh, just printed pieces of paper. Funny, so, funny you should use that uh, set of words. Um, I, I've seen uh, there's a similar project called WalletVoting.com um, out in Phoenix. Uh, Ernest Hancock promotes it on his radio program, uh, and and uh, they're embedding uh, silver dimes inside a card. They're taking a business card, punching a hole, putting in a, a silver dime, and then they have uh, different propaganda or information on the card, and they laminate the entire thing. Yes. So, uh, I, you know, again, I, I think all of this is, is a good thing. I think my, my own research suggests that it would uh, take uh, a sizable initial capital investment, something on the order of a few hundred thousand to a million dollars, to start producing the kinds of certificates I've described here on a mass scale. And, and let's face it, you know, you're not going to make much of a difference handing out five certificates at a time at Pork fest. I'm not disparaging pork fest here. I'm just saying yeah. five at a time is not going to make any difference. You have to print these things by the hundreds of thousands or and eventually by the millions. And that means a certain amount of investment in equipment to, you know, roll out the strips, uh, cut them to a very precise length, check that it's an honest weight. You know, you're, you're putting your own name on these and, and uh, uh, saying that it's a true weight embedding them in the certificate, uh, you know, uh, printing the certificate with uh, distinctive marks, perhaps some security features so that people can tell that it's been tampered with or that someone's clipped the gold or something like that. Uh, and then eventually, if you want these things to be, uh, to start circulating, you have to provide the people who accept a lot of them, like merchants or banks, with the tools to do more uh, detailed checks that they're authentic. And here's where the gold-bearing certificate, I think, really starts to shine because unlike a paper dollar where I have to look for clever bits of information hidden, hidden in the printing process, mm -hmm. here I can use the, you know, the physical characteristics of gold. <laughs> so gold has, you know, for example, you can test it with ultrasound. It has very specific properties. You can test it with x-rays. It has very specific properties. It has very specific properties with regard to thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity, all of which that are quite difficult to duplicate because it has to do with the nature of the element, gold. So uh, instead of having to spend a lot of money and time on elaborate printing techniques and other tricks to, to make it hard to reproduce the, the image on the certificate, you would provide people who are accepting these certificates with tools to check that it was really gold that was embedded in it. And I think that, that's probably where my business opportunity is, is uh, producing those instruments. I'm, I understand uh, the gold and its uh, properties very well. Uh, printing a million things uh, with a very high degree of uh, quality and uniformity and so forth. I know it's possible, but it's not my personal uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping someone who, like I say, listens to this or sees this uh, presentation will take uh, take the idea and run with it a little bit, and uh, perhaps hopefully two or three, and we'll get some good competition going. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. And, uh, well, you mentioned, of course, uh, the the House case uh, that sort of on, on people's minds uh, since it happened in the last week. Um, from what I understand, and I've, I've heard this secondhand, um, he uh, had some sort of in-your-face um, uh, tactics with introducing the Liberty Dollar. Uh, while he may not have committed any crimes or done anything, uh, had any harm, um, he, he did focus the attention of the Federal Reserve on him. Um, have you got any um, comments or, or uh, suggestions about what, what sort of effect that's had on the market for trading precious metals? Well, I don't know what it'll have on the market for precious metals, but I, I certainly um, followed uh, the Liberty Dollar for uh, for quite some time now, 
and I I had a couple of, of problems with that model. Uh, if on the slide deck that I gave you, slide twenty has some uh, relevant remarks. Uh, so the the first thing that that I criticized about the Liberty Dollar years ago was that it used the word dollar, and I think that is uh, borderline, if not uh, certainly unethical, because the uh, the the, the case of the government made, and in, in fact, just the, the, the ethics of the situation are that you are confusing consumers, or at least potentially confusing consumers, by saying that this thing is a dollar, but the dollar is, you know, that's what the government prints and puts on their pieces of the paper. So you're taking the government head on, and you're also creating a potential, at least, for confusion about what these things are. And there were uh, frequent uh, reports from the field of less scrupulous people using uh, Liberty Dollars, uh, pushing them on merchants and saying things like, oh, these are the new dollars, which, you know, that's that's fraud. That's just not what they are. So, um, let's see, I think you're on a slightly different uh, slide than what I was showing. Uh, the slide, I, it's right one before that one. Uh, ethics of gold-bearing certificates, it says. Okay. It should be up and, here in just a moment. Right. And so, uh, basically, I didn't have to figure all this out myself. Uh, smarter people than me have been thinking and writing about this for for a long time. Um, so, uh, that was one problem, his use of the word dollar. Uh, another problem was uh, directly taking on the, uh, the the federal government. I mean, I was asking for a fight, and, uh, you know, it's one you're going to lose. Uh and so what I concluded for my gold-bearing certificates is that, that I must not claim that they are what they are not yet, which is money. I don't make that choice. The market makes that choice. Yeah. But Von Nauthaus and the Liberty Dollar Group did make the explicit claim that they had an alternate money here. They called it currency and so forth, but nonetheless. Uh, and here's uh, Mr. Holzman, who's written an excellent book that I recommend to anyone who's interested in this subject. You should You should know this book backwards and forwards. Uh, it's called The Ethics of Money Production, and he's quoting what may be the first economist, uh, Oresme, who said that it's not licit to produce coins that by their name or other features resemble other coins. And that's, of course, precisely what the Liberty Dollar did. Uh, they, I won't argue that they were better in many ways than the coins that they attempted to replace, but they nonetheless, they used that word, and they did have uh, that, uh, they failed this test. Uh, the other thing that I think was missing from the Liberty Dollar, which and I found objectionable, is they were not redeemable. So they were sold at a very high premium. Uh, I, I have a number of Liberty Dollars, but I never paid $20 for a Liberty coin marked $20. Because when I bought them, I got them as silver rounds from silver dealers, and they sold it to me for the spot price of silver plus a very small commission of order, you know, 50 cents a coin or something like that. Mm -hmm. So back when I was buying these things, I was paying, you know, $7 an ounce or something like that for a coin whose face value was $20. Now, there's nothing wrong with stamping the unit 20 on your coin. But, of course, as soon as you stamp it with the word dollar, you've now got yourself in a problem because of the, as the dollar goes down and down in value over time, your, your coin is further and further removed from, from that value. And uh, furthermore, the, uh, again, there's the, the confusion issue that uh, you're confusing people with, uh, with dollars and, uh, and your coins. So I yeah, think he, he created a lot of trouble for himself, and uh, I, I'm very sorry to see, you know, to see him uh, convicted the way he was, and hopefully he'll find ways to appeal it. But I, I could see trouble coming because of the way he went about this. Hmm. We've, we've got a comment in the chat room uh, about uh, a date when the, the definition of the dollar is declared and set at a certain weight of silver. Um, this, this well, who, you know, who does the declaration exactly. and who enforces it? Exactly. What, what if I decide that if I don't like silver, I want to use gold? And what if the guy next door to me want to use uh, copper? Uh, I'm a, I believe in free markets, and I want the consumers to decide. And I, I don't just, you know, as there's no uh, problem these days buying your music, whether you like country western or modern 
music or old classics, the market serves all of those. Well, I don't see why there's any reason why the market can't serve up different kinds of money. And I suspect uh, different sorts of, through the process of competition would come to dominate, but you don't have to force it on anyone by, by having some supreme ruler say today is the new dollar day. Yeah, because uh, that, if he has that's the not how I see that, this coming about. He'll certainly do it in his favor and, and to your detriment. I'm sorry? I, I say if he has the power to do that, to declare the value of some certain product, he's certainly going to do it. Uh, at least the temptation will be there and, and just about unavoidable that he'd declare it in such a way that it benefits him and, and works to the detriment of the rest of the market. Exactly. I think that power is, is too too large to trust with anyone, you know, to anyone, to any mortal man. So instead we have to put that power back in the hands of consumers where it belongs. I still see my friend Gil Guillory is uh, asking a question, next steps and where I need help. Um, well, there's a couple uh, areas. Uh, I've been doing some simple tests, which is basically to print these things up and carry, carry them around in my wallet for the past two years to see how they stand up to wear and tear. And they stand up remarkably well. Some of the printing didn't work so well, but the certificate and the strips themselves don't mind the, the flexing and the wear and tear of being carried around in a, in a wallet and taken out and put back and so forth. So that tells me something about the basic viability. I think uh, uh, the other thing I need to do is, frankly, I need to, to write a business plan and raise some capital. As I say, it's going to take a, a sum of something like a few hundred thousand to uh, uh, maybe a, a million or so dollars to be able to produce these things at a reasonable cost. I, my own market research suggests that I cannot uh, expect to sell a lot of these. And again, it doesn't do much good unless you sell a whole lot of them. I can't expect to sell a lot of these unless I can sell them for a relatively small premium to the price of gold. So maybe 5% or 6% or maybe the market will delight me and tolerate 10%. But it certainly won't tolerate a 50 or 100 percent markup, which is what you saw with the uh, uh, you know, Liberty Dollars and, and other attempts at this. So we have to get that marginal cost down to the point where when someone sees the price of gold in the newspaper and they bought a hundredth of an ounce from you yesterday, they don't automatically say to themselves, hey, I got cheated. That, that kind of message just will, uh, will kill the product. So there's that. And then in any business like this, um, the heavy lifting actually is done in distribution, and that's you know that's there's some interesting issues here, and Gill actually might have some uh, interesting thoughts about it because there's security involved. You know, the, the, while it's not money, it is certainly valuable. <laughs> and so if if I'm going to uh, print up say you know a uh, hundred thousand of these things with a hundredth of an ounce of gold in each one, well, that's a thousand ounces of gold. That's a fair amount of money. How do I get that to different people? How do I physically get the to them and make sure that you know they pay me and so forth. Uh, there's redemption services. I think you don't. I don't have to offer this as a entrepreneur here, but if they start to become widely accepted, there will be a need in the marketplace for someone to say, "Okay, you bring me a hundred of uh, Steve certificates, or maybe you bring me a hundred ten of Steve certificates that are, say they're a hundredth of an ounce of gold, and I'll give you a one ounce gold coin." So he's, he needs to make a little money on the a little profit on the on the trade, so he won't just give you one one hundredth of an ounce, you know, times a hundred is equal to one ounce gold coin, but he, he might give you 406 or 110, he'll give you a gold coin. That's um, an area that could use some investigation. So there's, there's distribution problems to be solved, there's marketing problems to be solved, there's production problems to be solved, all three of those need some more attention. Um, more work in making analytical equipment. Well, I have a bunch of ideas there, and that's probably my long suit. Not that there's not room for, for other people, but my I have a background in, in physics, and, uh, and particularly in X-ray spectroscopy, and I know a fair amount about ways to prove that this is gold and can only be gold and uh, can't be easily counterfeited. Hmm. And... Uh so Gil was telling me about uh, a plan for redemption. Uh, perhaps that's what he's talking about in the chat room now with uh, uh, Mr. Nair's paper at ASC. 
Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Sorry, Ms. Nair. No, unfortunately, I, uh, the, the demands of my day job prevented me from attending AFC this year, which I very much regretted. Uh, so I, I'm not familiar with that paper, so I'll, I'll have to read that uh, when I can. Uh, I certainly agree with uh, what Shar Silver is saying about decentralization. Uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, you, that's one, one of the reasons why I'm giving this idea away. I want everyone who listens to go out and get themselves a laser printer and buy some gold ribbon or whatever else, you gold ink, whatever you like, and start experimenting with your own and get these out here. Uh, there's no reason that it has to be just me. And, in fact, the further we spread the idea and start e- exchanging information about uh, production methods, uh, how to you know, measure uniformity, uh, how to do redemption, so on and so forth, uh, the sooner this thing becomes a reality. So it's it's much too big a, an idea for one person to try and hold. And of course, as a, a libertarian, I don't uh, have a, a great uh, deal of regard for the notion of intellectual property. In any case, I think, uh, and as a businessman, I know ideas are cheap. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's the time and the time and effort to turn these things, you know, these ideas into actual products and get them into the hands of consumers, that's where the value gets added. Well, I'll I'll see if uh, Gil can can do better at a summary than I can, but I believe what he was telling me that uh, there was an idea that uh, um, he had seen for redemption of the certificates where the offer wasn't made to redeem an issued currency in in gold, but to redeem it in dollars, uh, so that you were basically making a promise that um, at any future stage I will redeem this certificate for um, X amount of dollars, uh, expecting full well that the, uh, that the dollars would depreciate in any certificate that was bearing physical gold in it. Would, would be appreciating in value. And so people would never uh, never want to take up on that offer to exchange for redemption. Uh, they, they'd purchase them and then they'd stay in circulation. Um, well, there, I think, you know, there, there are times you would want to re- do them for dollars. And again, the, the wonderful thing about the marketplace, the free market, is it doesn't say you have to exchange certificates for coins or certificates for bars or certificates for silver or anything else. You can, you can exchange them for whatever you want. And so, uh, one ca- one reason that uh, you might treat your certificate in for dollars is so you can pay your taxes. The government's going to want their taxes paid in their paper money, so fine. You know, trade your certificates in and pay the government in dollars. Uh, someone else might decide that they need silver for whatever purpose. Uh, another person might find that they can make a market uh, redeeming these things in copper or in tobacco or who knows. So uh, the the general question of redemption uh, has a lot of interesting issues, but I don't think we have to limit ourselves to saying, well, only redeem in gold or only redeem in dollars or, or any other thing. And, and again, the, the, the people doing the redemption don't have to be the same people who are doing the production. They can be, but they don't have to be. Well, Thank I, you for the link. Oh, I will uh, uh, definitely follow up on this. I, I think it's, it's one of the things on my to-do list is to finish writing my version of this paper and uh, of my paper and uh, put it out there for publication and uh, criticism and uh, advance the idea that way. Well, and uh, any uh, any plans into the future? You'll tell me you're relocating and. Well, I, I divide my time now between uh, Massachusetts and Texas, and uh, both my wife and I uh, hope that as time goes on, there'll be relatively more time in Texas. Uh, but summers in New England are actually quite lovely, and uh, we'll, we'll probably maintain a presence up here uh, for the foreseeable future, at least. Uh, but we certainly uh, you know, are enjoying Texas. We bought ourselves a, a very nice house out in the uh, hill country and uh, going down there again in just a couple weeks and uh, really look forward to that uh, time down there. And eventually I will, uh, it seems that whenever I'm down there between clients that we have in the area and stuff we want to do for ourselves, I just have no time (laughs) at all. (laughs) But eventually I want to make contact with some of the people at the University of Texas uh, and so forth and uh, begin talking to them about some of these ideas. Nice. Well... Uh, I hope it it goes well. Uh, it, it's 
certainly an interesting idea. Uh, uh, it's convenient. I, I agree that uh, in, in a lot of the discussions, uh, I see people talk about the need to get back to the gold standard, and, and they sort of hold adherence to a gold standard is higher than an adherence to what the market chooses. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad you make the distinction clear, and I'm glad that's part of the business plan. Well, yes, very much. I, I think it, you know, as long as we sit around and wait for the day when someone will liberate us and put us back on the gold standard, that we'll do just that. We'll wait. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we are uh, libertarians and uh, anarcho capitalists and we believe in free market economics and the wisdom of free markets and consumers and entrepreneurs, then we should walk that talk and put the product out there and find out what consumers like and what they don't and uh, follow it as far as we can. Okay, well, that it looks like in the chat room uh, there's somebody uh, that will be at Porkfest looking to purchase some of your certificates. So, uh, we'll, we'll see if it can. I don't know when is it this year. I, uh, I'll follow the link. I don't know the, the schedule. I, I had hoped to have some uh, certificates ready for Porkfest last year, but I just didn't have the, the time. I only had half a dozen or so available. So uh, if I'm in town, I will uh, do my best to come up there. I actually have now sort of 50 or 100 certificates that I've uh, various prototypes I've produced. So love to meet up with some people there. Sounds well, maybe you should uh, take the manufacturing equipment up there and <laughs> start selling that. With, uh, uh, well, really, right now the manufacturing equipment is I buy a ribbon off the internet from people who make it. I buy uh, labels of this uh, polymer. Uh, they're just sheet labels. And then I run it to a laser printer. <laughs> it's no more complicated than that. Now, that's expensive. You know, you end up having uh, a certificate that, that costs, you know, a third or, or more of the value to make of the value of the gold ribbon. So, and the gold ribbon sells for a substantial premium to the melt price of gold. So, as I say, to go from this sort of prototype proof of principle stage where I am right now to actually printing these things by the hundreds of thousands is going to require an investment. And uh, to do that, I need to either save up my own money or get a group of backers, you know, write a business plan and so forth and uh, figure out uh, how, to, how to make a business of this. Good. Well, thanks for joining us today. And, and uh, I hope to stay in touch with you. Um, come visit us at ancapentrepreneur.net. I'm, I'm hoping...